Hello, you're listening to Abstract AF and I'm Sneha Jaswal. It's been less than three months and we are already on episode number 21. I've done three editions of 10 book reviews under 10 minutes, which means we have talked about at least 30 books so far. And I think maybe it's finally time we talk about one of my own books, which also happens to be my debut fiction novel titled Bad Town Kids. The story is set in the fictional town of Dakhinpur and is about four friends, Anita, Madesh, Mokshit and Saira, and how their lives change over a period of a decade. The idea was to write a simple book that anybody can pick up on the weekend and let the story take them back in time, since it takes place in a time before cell phones and the internet boom. But the friends still have their own problems to deal with, and one of them even tries to take their own life, and is even successful at the attempt. And despite dealing with some serious themes, it's not a dark book. It's, I would say, a slice of life type of novel. There's no mystery or mind-boggling twists. Although there are one or two unexpected secrets that the friends keep from each other that's revealed as the story progresses. So for this episode, I'm going to be reading the first chapter from Bad Town Kids. Chapter 1 the witch. Dakhinpur is the kind of town you wouldn't hear about unless you were born there or had some familial connection to it. Some wouldn't even call it a town since large swaths of the region resembled a rural hamlet, but it had close to 10,000 inhabitants. It was as if Dakhinpur suffered from an existential crisis. Some parts looked like a village with endless rice and paddy fields and innumerable little ponds where the locals would take their early morning dips. Then there would be stretches with almost no greenery, dotted with crumbling old residential buildings and dilapidated mills that no longer manufactured anything. How do you define a place like that, which has no distinct characteristic of its own? Like the rusty skeleton of a building surviving only by its breath, with no architectural attributes that stood out. It was a town teeming with lifeless structures made by slaving hands that were perhaps paid just enough to not collapse to their deaths. In one such nondescript heap of concrete lived Anita. Despite being an ordinary looking house, it belonged to one of the most affluent families in town. It even had a name of its own, Nishok Nile. While Nishok had been the name of Anita's diseased grandfather, Nile was the Hindi word for home. One only had to say Nishok Nile, and almost every rickshawwala in town would know where to take them. The wicked witch of Dakhinpur, Anita's cousin Mokshit, called her. But she was neither odd in colour, nor wild to look at. Instead, she had near-perfect features, like those big doe eyes that could bedazzle men with just a little off-hand badger by the roadside. In a town full of middling men and women, who were never up to date with what was in vogue, Anita was almost exotic. But young women like her were easy victims to slander and gossip in small towns like Dakhinpur. Mokshat called her a witch in jest, but there were whispers about her being a man-eater, that the men who fell for her charms would also fall to their eventual deaths. It took only one death to fuel the vicious rumours. Lakshmi Kant, a 20-year-old unemployed boy, had stalked her for over a year before he was found dead under mysterious circumstances. People said he was her boyfriend, But if close friends knew he wasn't, Anita had just started college and was still in her late teens when the stalking commenced. For months, he took the same bus as her to the next town, about 70 minutes away, and then cautiously trailed her as she headed to college. Every day, it was the same routine. He would wait for her at the bus stop, get on the vehicle, follow her to college, and then disappear, only to reappear at the bus stop the next day. At first, Anita found it amusing to have a stalker. In her part of the world, it was almost a privilege to have a crazy admirer follow you so diligently. Her friends thought he was appealing, even though he had the kind of face you wouldn't be able to recall the next day. But the movies they saw glorified such men. Men who were unrelenting in their love, who pursued the girl even if she didn't acknowledge his existence. In Anita's case, Lakshmi Kant quietly followed her never expecting her to say a word, never speaking himself, only glad to walk in the same space as her. A lot of people in Dakhinpur took note of his obsession, 
obviously assuming that there was something going on between the two. But who was Lakshmi Kant? Why did he die suddenly? One could answer the first question, but the second was a bit of a mystery. One needs to know who Anita was, and only then will Lakshmi Kant be relevant. Anita lived next door to Madesh, the boy she grew up playing hide and seek with. Mokshit, on the other hand, lived in the same house as her. Nishok Nile was their sprawling abode with two floors and eight rooms, always bustling with the sounds of Anita's big joint family, which included her parents and the families of her father's two brothers. Her father Mahinder was the youngest of the three. Mokshit was the adopted son of the eldest brother Dhiren, whose wife Sarita couldn't bear a child, despite their repeated efforts. The second brother had two daughters and one son, Ridhima, Mahima and Lohit, all of whom were packed off to a boarding school and made guest appearances in the town only during vacations. Anita was the only child and her mother doted upon her, so she was fated to study in a mediocre school in Dakhinpur and later in an obscure college that was not too far. This, despite the fact that all the brothers were doing well financially, and all of them received an equal share of money from both their textile business and 12 jointly owned shops in the Kinpur's main market. Spoiled silly by her mother and coddled even more by her father, Anita led an easy life. While her cousins cried their eyes out before the start of every school season, refusing to pack for their hostel, Anita would watch television sitting on her father's lap as her mother hovered above them, massaging her hair with oil and tying them up in neat plates. A typical day in life of young Anita was very simple. She would get up early in the morning, have Bharat Natyam lessons at home, get ready for school, go through classes in a daze, come back, change, drink turmeric milk with biscuits and rush out to the open ground across their homes where she, Madesh, Mukshit and her classmate Saira would play hide and seek or lock and key or some other silly outdoor game. Or they would go cycling wherever the road led, venture into someone's field, chase baby goats, lie in the grass and tell each other exaggerated tales about what happened in school. Moitra's mother came today with a dozen aunties and uncles and thrashed the math teacher black and blue just because Moitra complained at home that he had hit her. You should have seen them gang up against the teacher. They beat him up with big sticks and he cried like an ass. I'm serious, he sounded like a donkey brain. The principal and the other teachers had to rush in and pull them apart. And then Moitra's mother flared up like a dinosaur and abused the principal too. She called him a dumb moron and even threatened to drag him to the cops. And then she hit the math teacher again. You could see her fingerprints on the man's face. The principal had to fold his hands and beg Moitra's mother to stop the ruckus and let him handle the matter. Moitra's mother was like a big monster in front of him. She huffed and puffed and fumed and finally stormed out with an entourage of fat uncles and aunties. Anita said with excitement and then laughed as she called the middle-aged men and women fat. They were in 8th grade back then, only 13 years old. Bullshit, Mokshit said in a soft but assertive tone with no expression on his face. He was a year older to them, but much taller, towering over the others at almost six feet. What do you mean? You didn't even come to school today, where were you? She shot back at Mokshit. It's none of your business, he said coldly. Mokshit was in the habit of skipping school and playing cricket close to the railway tracks with a bunch of kids whose parents couldn't care less if they attended classes or not or he would steal a book from his mother's fiction collection and read it near the pond behind their school. Madesh didn't go to the same school as Mokshit and Anita. His parents had admitted him to an English medium school in the next town, Sarast Nagar, which was an hour away while the other three were studying in a Hindi medium school. Saira would sometimes pray in gratitude that her parents let her attend school at all. Unlike some of her poorer cousins who held odd jobs and never saw the face of a classroom. Like Anita, Saira too thought it was peculiar that a studious boy like Mokshit would sneak out of their school and just disappear. Madish was the only one among them who knew where Mokshit passed his time, only because Mokshit had invited him a few times as well. If you ever want to cut school, let me know a day in advance. I'll take you near the tracks and introduce you to some of my other friends he had offered. It was hard to imagine that he had other friends. The quiet, brooding Mokshit 
who liked to drift away in his own thoughts when they hung out. It was always Anita who did most of the talking, and she could go on and on. Sometimes, Madish would offer mundane silly tales too. Like the time he caught hold of a dead cockroach and passed it to a classmate, who in turn dangled it in the air and grossed everyone in the class out. She is not lying, I was there. Saira finally came to a friend's defense. Moitra's mother really did beat the math teacher. She would have even beaten the principal if she wanted to. In fact, it looked like she really wanted to beat the principal. She idolized Anita and would always stand by her stories, no matter how bizarre, far-fetched, or downright ridiculous they sometimes were. And did she come with a gang of a dozen other people? Mokshit asked straightforwardly. Not that many, but there were at least five or six of them. You know Anita is bad at math. Saira giggled. For all the support she lent to Anita, Saira couldn't always lie. Hey, whose friend are you? Mine or this rat? There were at least nine people for sure. Anita held out her hands above her head, showing nine of her fingers. Calling me a rat, eh? Have you ever looked at your face in the mirror? Being the least worst-looking girl in your class doesn't make you pretty, you know. Mukshit said nonchalantly. You don't have to be so mean, Anita said hurt. She crossed her hands and glared at him with a pout. It was unusual for him to say something harsh. Ya, Mokshit, why are you being mean? Anita is the prettiest girl in the whole school. Saira stepped up for her friend again. She fondly pulled Anita's cheek to show her appreciation. The sun has set. I think we should head home. Madesh spoke up, changing the topic. He liked playing the pacifier before things could get out of hand. I will cycle with Saira up to her house and then come back, Mokshit offered, considering she didn't live just across the road like the rest of them. Let's all race there on our cycles. The winner gets to decide what games we'll play for the rest of the month, Anita said. The pout was gone. Her eyes were instead glinting with excitement at the thought. That evening they had played Ludo. Anita absolutely hated it, but the other three voted against her. Very smart, Anita. You're the fastest among us when it comes to cycling. Why don't we have an arm wrestling match instead? Madesh outstretched his hands and challenged her. It's getting late. Pick up your cycle, Saira. These two can arm wrestle. Mokshit said. He was already holding the handlebars of his cycle. Hey, we are coming too. No one's arm wrestling, Anita said. Why do I need to be escorted? I can go back on my own, Saira protested. No, it's gotten dark already. I won't let you go home alone. Anita, you head home to where your mother will lecture me about it. Tomorrow we can disperse before the sun sets and I won't have to drop you. He said matter-of-factly. No further arguments were made. The town, unfortunately, was not the kind where a girl could roam without a care after the sun had set. The roads were dimly lit and the majority of the inner lanes didn't have any street lights at all. The kids were expected to be home before 6pm and to study till at least 8pm. And then there would be dinner, some television and then sleep. But on most days, there would be power cuts in the evenings, so they couldn't get much of the television anyway. While Anita and Mokshit were expected to study on their own, Madesh had a tuition teacher who came home to monitor his homework and academic progress. His father owned a small but successful jewellery shop, so their finances were solid too. Madesh's family could afford a private tutor for him, while most kids in the town were either left on their own or crammed on the floor of one of the few teachers who ran tuition centres. From the window of his room, he could clearly see the veranda of Anita's house, where she and Mokshit would sit and do their homework. Despite the aura of a rich, obnoxious brat, Anita was an uncomplicated girl who just liked to tell exaggerated tales which were almost never about her. She didn't take her early morning Bharatnatyam classes seriously. Academically, she was dull, barely managing enough numbers to pass. Sometimes she would even flunk a subject, not that she wasn't bright or had a hard time grasping what the teachers taught. She just had a very short attention span, especially when it came to studies. Besides, despite being an engaging conversationalist, she was capable of being quite mean sometimes. But none of that ever stopped people from falling in love with her. It was hard to guess how many other boys felt the same way about her, as Lakshmi Kant did. But it was harder for anyone to understand why the wicked witch of Dakhinpur ended her own life at the age of 21, a death that shook the entire town.
Well, that's the end of chapter one from Bat Town Kids. And if you enjoyed listening to it and are curious to find out what happens next, you can order your copy on Amazon.com.in or any other Amazon site across the world. You can get it within seconds on the Kindle app on your phone. So go ahead, check Bat Town Kids out. And that's all for this episode. I'll talk to you in the next one.